If you change your mind, you change your life, just change your mind. The Lord loves you. He's standing with his arms wide open for you. Oh, oh, oh. Be encouraged, cause this day's for you. Don't you let this opportunity pass by you.
Good morning, everybody, and thank you for tuning in here at Changing Your Mind Ministries for this first Sunday in 2021. I know we're still excited and, and forever grateful to God that we made it this far. Thank you for tuning in. I am Pastor Wendell Jones, and so excited to have you guys be with us this morning. CYM, I love you. I miss you. It's been a long time since we've been able to hang out in person, but I'm so grateful that y'all are so faithful with tuning in and streaming. I really appreciate it. Go ahead and do me a favor. Let's go ahead and start sharing this. I know some of us are having some issues with Facebook and you can't create a watch party, but you still can share. So go ahead and share right now. Let's touch as many people as we possibly can. Before we step over into this new series, God blessed us. He really blessed me and I, I hope that he blessed you with the last series on discernment. But he's moving me into another direction, another direction of healing for us. As we move into this year, we've got to get healthy uh, so that those issues don't continue to trip us up as we strive to do the will of God and to really grab our lives back. We really do intend for this year to be a year of restoration, uh, reversal and revival. Restoration, reversal and revival. But in order to walk in those things, we got to be real serious about our healing. I'm very serious about my own, and I want to take you there with me. Come on, pray with me. Father, we thank you for the privilege of, of ministering your word again. We thank you for the blessing of just being alive. You have kept us for another Sunday. Holy Spirit, heighten my gift. Heighten everything in me that makes this moment effective. Angels, draw people into the broadcast the ones that need to hear this message. From my lips to their ears, do something incredible, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are starting this new series, Overcoming Your Losses. Overcoming Your Losses. Uh, as I was getting ready for this Sunday, guys, I, I felt like it would be so irresponsible of me to take off running into the new year and, and preach all of these other things, these messages about what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do. I want to, but the reality of it is is that we have some unfinished business uh, that hung over from last year. And we don't need to neglect that unfinished business because the calendar changed. We need to deal with that unfinished business because the calendar changed and to get us better equipped to move into this year, be effective be healthy. And so we're going to talk about for a few Sundays, overcoming your losses. And so we're going to kick off this thing with this, what I call the introductory sermon. We're not going to be able to get real deep right now. We're going to just be able to frame it just a little bit. And then over the course of the next few weeks, if you'll stay with me, we're going to dive deeper and deeper into this. And we'll be certain to touch on some things that you need immediately. And listen to me, for that stuff you don't feel like you need immediately, tell God thank you, but still pay attention. Because you never know, oftentimes what God will do is have you sitting there taking notes for somebody else, number one. Or number two, he's been Jehovah Jireh and he's providing you information because he's the God who provides because he sees. God sees what's coming over the horizon. And what a wonderful father he is to give you the information early. So don't act like this ain't about you. It just may not be about you now. Amen. All right, let's jump into this. And again, it's introductory, so I'm going to ask you to be patient and let me do what I do. Let me teach you. I want to walk through this very methodically because my aim is understanding, not being impressive. I want you to get it. That's what my heart is with you. I don't, I don't want to be a great entertainer. I want to be a great revelator, reveal truths to you where you can see where they apply to your life immediately. All right. We're going back into the Old Testament and look at some of the works of Solomon over in Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter and the third verse. Just one verse. Solomon writes these words. He says, sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. 
That's King James Version. Let me, let me read that to you one more time. Because it, it, it's not one of those verses that make your heart flutter. <laughs> it's go, it makes you go, what? Listen what he says. Sorrow is better than laughter. For the sadness of the countenance, the heart, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. King James Version. I want to talk to you from this subject. Make it make sense. Make it make sense. Listen to me. When the Trinity came to the agreement that it was time to make man, God, when I say God, I'm referring to all of them as one because in the beginning of Genesis, it's Elohim, and it means all of them. So when God decided to make mankind, he decided to make man like himself, meaning he made me a thinking creation. Say that with me, a thinking creation. Now, listen, we're going to start out teaching heavy from the beginning. In order for me to be able to think, that means that I also need information. And I need information that I can process. And in my processing, listen to me, this information has to make sense to me in order for me to act upon it, in order for me to be obedient, in order for me to do it, because I serve a God that requires me to do things, not just know things, but in order for me to get to the posture of doing, in order for you to get to the posture of being able to do something, you have to have information that instructs you, but you won't be instructed unless you what? Unless it makes sense to you. Because here's what I've learned about me, and I know it's true about you as well. Whatever doesn't make sense to me, it holds me up in that area of my life. Let me say that again. Making sense is paramount to my life and yours because, again, whatever does not make sense to me, it will hold me up in that area of my life. I can be successful over here financially, but have all these misunderstandings over here relationally, and I could be knocking it out the park over here and dying over here. And wherever I am dying, it runs the risk of sabotaging where I'm doing well. So wherever in your life, where the information the demonstration, the example that you saw, because whenever we look at something, it is creating information for us. Whoever we study is creating information for us as we, as we make sense or decide what it means in our head. If it does not make sense, that's the area of my life I get stunted. I get held up. If you believe that, then you begin to understand why God says, and here, here I go being a broken record again because Proverbs 4 and 7 means so much to me. Wisdom is the principal thing. It is the first thing we should pursue. Wisdom was so important to God that he refers to himself as wisdom throughout Proverbs and the 8th chapter. And not only that, he goes on in that same verse and he tells us with everything you try to do in your life, you better make sure that getting understanding is at the top of your list. In other words, you got to grab this information and make sure it makes sense because whatever, I notice this is very commonsensical what I'm about to say, whatever does not make sense to you, you cannot do it. But here's the thing about life. Just because it does not make sense to you does not mean that life won't require it of you. How many times have, has life shown up at your doorstep making a demand of you on some subject matter that you don't understand. And it does not have the courtesy of waiting on you. I am, you are, a thinking creation, a cerebral, a thinking creation 
of God. But in order for me to really think, I got to be supplied with information. I've got to be supplied with information. And so the intent of God was that you and I, yes, be thinkers, but we were also called to think like him. And which means that we were supposed to be in pursuit of the information that he supplies to us. Because, listen, I am going to become whatever I think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Y'all know that scripture. This is how God designed you and me. Design us to be thinkers. Design us to become whatever we get into our system. Whatever information we receive, that now begins to spur our development. I become whatever I think. Now, now you ought to begin to understand more clearly the enemy's, uh, let's just say, trick against us. This is why God's word refers to him as the father of what? Lies. Because he also provides information that contradicts the information of God. What you and I don't realize that's happening in this invisible spiritual realm around us is a race between heaven and hell trying to get to you and I to supply us with, these, with this information because both Satan, realize, Satan and God know that our makeup is such that whatever information we get, that's what we will develop into. Are y'all hearing me? And that information has to make sense to us in order for us to do it. See, this is why scripture goes on to tell us, Paul wrote about this quite a bit. He, told, he tells us this, he said, you and I, we don't wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities. What, is, what, is principal, what are principalities? Information that was given to you in the beginning. He tells the church at Corinth to cast down imagination. What are imaginations? These are stories that you have concocted in your head based off of the information that you have received. And he says, you've got to cast down everything that seeks to exalt itself above God, exalt itself up above the information of God that God is trying to get to you. That's why God goes and tells us that you and I will be changed by what? By the renewing of our minds. God expects you and I to be thinkers. He goes on to tell you and me that we need to let this mind be in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. Paul writes also, he says, this is what I need you to do. Think on these things, whatever is good, whatever is holy, what is a, whatever is of good report. I need you to think on these things because whatever information that you digest, it begins to be the ingredient to your development. I will become whatever I think. Because God made me this thinking creature. And in order for me to think, I've got to have information. He even gave us the gift of repentance. Repentance means to change your mind. You're still dealing with how we think. So the conclusion that we ought to reach in that is that my movement, your movement, is determined by how much what we hear, what we receive, what we see in the form of information, how much it makes sense. Now, let me tell you what we, what we um, stumble a little bit. I feel like I need to calm down. I'm excited about this message. Sometimes we confuse making sense with what's acceptable. I've said it again. Sometimes we confuse with what makes sense with what's acceptable. See, listen, there are some acceptable things that don't make sense. See, being stuff that is acceptable, ways of thinking, ways of acting, uh, 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 beliefs that we carry and transfer, some of these things are acceptable because it's acceptable for three reasons. It's acceptable for the people that we might be around. It's acceptable because of where we might live. It is also acceptable because of the time in which we live. But when I talk about 
something making sense. Making sense is referring to truth. See, the thing about truth is that truth doesn't change no matter who you're around. Truth does not change no matter where you live. Truth does not change no matter what generation you came up in. That can't be said about the things that are acceptable. There's some stuff that's acceptable depending on the crowd you're with. And you got to lay it down based on another crowd that shows up. There's some stuff that's acceptable based on where you grew up, the household, the neighborhood, the city, whatever, the state, even in many cases, the country in many cases, where you grew up, that's not technically truth. It is just what's acceptable in that particular place. What's acceptable might be based on what time you came up in, what generation you came up in. Because with each preceding generation, some things become much more acceptable, but they really don't make sense. Making sense, again, is in alignment with truth. Truth is only found in the Word of God. Truth is so stable that the Bible says this, that, the, that heaven and earth will pass away, but the Word, the truth of God, will remain. You and I as believers, in order for something to make sense, in order for this life to make sense, we have to align it with the one who made life. That's how things make sense. See, when things don't make sense, it creates trauma. Trauma is, 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 trauma simply comes out of events that create, uh, events that create memories that are wrapped in emotions that cause me to do things that work against my best interests. Mm. When things don't make sense, it causes trauma. Let's say that again. And what trauma is, it comes out of events. Something happened. And those events are then wrapped in these events create memories, triggers, things that pop up that are now wrapped in your emotions that cause you to do things that work against your best interests. And that is because we have ventured away from what makes sense and oftentimes just simply do the things that are acceptable. Trauma doesn't make sense to us because it is something that occurred and we don't know where to place it in our lives. We don't know where to place it in our thinking. And so it roams freely within our minds and our heart and doing damage to all areas of our lives. But God is trying to help you and I to take those same events that seek to be transformed, formed into trauma, and say, let me help you make sense of that so that you can rise above it, even use it without it using you. Listen, 2020 created several of these events. And so what you and I are gonna try to do today as I walk you through this introduction we're going to use 2020 as our test year, as our case year for us to begin to understand some things. To be able to understand what to do with these losses. So I understand that your losses happened in the, in the years before 2020, but we're going to start at 2020 and we're going to master this year and then you'll know what to do for those other things. But we're going to use this year to try to understand, listen to what I say here, to understand our need to grieve the losses of 2020. Loss requires grieving before the loss will turn you loose. See, that, that's, 
that part right there ought to resonate with you because that false information that we've been receiving all this time has tried to coach you and me into believing that we don't have time to grieve, which is why we are still entangled in the losses of our lives. And here we are weighed down by years of losses and grief upon grief upon grief. No, let me rephrase it, unresolved grief upon unresolved grief and still trying our best to go do something great for God. No wonder we're becoming weary in well-doing. No wonder the believers are worn out. No wonder we're agitated and angry and oftentimes bitter people because I've got a wagon full of unresolved things that I'm dragging behind me. Because at some point, I was told that it was inappropriate, unnecessary to grieve. I'm here today giving you permission. I'm here today to give you permission to acknowledge the losses and to grieve them. I need us to understand how these losses, and watch this, even some of the things that you don't even can, can consider losses, but were really losses. I want you to understand how they're affecting you now. And if we don't deal with them, we'll drag them into our tomorrows like we've done so many other things. Hmm. I even feel the heaviness as I'm talking to you now because I'm, I'm, I'm not talking to you from a position of somebody who has already gone through this. I am being made aware of this along with you. You and I both, if we're really honest, we're feeling heavy coming out of 2020 because we are still grieving some of the losses. And you know what the sad part is? Many of us will even have a hard time acknowledging the grief because we're so accustomed to it. This doesn't feel like anything new. This just feels like where you live. Let me say this to you again. Grief is about loss. And grief is weighty. It's heavy. It burdens you down. Not allowing you to have the agility, the strength, the movement that you that's required of us to move forward in the things of God. See, some of you listening today, you actually, this year, you actually experienced the loss of a loved one. And so grief for you makes a lot more sense than those of us who didn't lose people, but we have losses. And see, here's the thing, and let me just, you know, I'm going to take my time and just risk some of you may clicking off, but those of you who feel me, please stay on. I'm going I'm to stay right here at this pace right here. Society allows those who have lost people to grieve. But it shuns those of us who have lost, who have lost other things. Lost people to death, rather. But if we lost people due to relationship ending, jobs changing, We've lost our ability to worship together. We, we, we've lost our sense of freedom. We've, some of you have lost jobs during this time. Uh, 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 we've lost the right to just touch each other. That's a loss. And it has brought with it a heaviness. Hmm. I've had to counsel people this year who who had relationships that ended because somebody was mad because the other person could no longer be with them, touch them. And I'm like, but it's COVID. But sometimes the impatience and the immaturity that's out there make people do silly things 
only to find themselves in a place of loss after they realize that they made an immature decision. But still, there's loss that you're dealing with. Hear me when I say this. Listen. I try to improve our understanding of what I'm saying. And believe it or not, I'm, I'm so close to being done because I told you this is just going to be introductory. Listen to me. Whenever there is any form of attachment, you cannot avoid the feeling of loss when that attachment is broken. Listen to me, because I need you to understand why you feel. I want it to make sense to you. Why do I feel like this, Pastor? Because, you know, I got somebody over here, they lost their mother, they lost their father, they lost their grandparent, and, but I'm over here heavy too. And you're not taking into consideration that you've gone through some losses yourself. Because, again, whenever there is an attachment, and that attachment is broken for whatever reason, that's loss. And your body is asking for, your mind and your heart is asking for the right to grieve. Tina, I'm, 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 I'm amazed sometimes how people get down on preachers and, well, let's say pastors rather, when pastors seem to get upset when people leave their churches. They seem to forget that there was a relationship there there was some degree of attachment. And what's amazing about that is that while people are there, there is an expectation that it is relational, that there is caring, that there is exchange. And so when somebody leaves, it's amazing to me that the pastor can't be human and feel the loss. Because whenever... An attachment is broken. Loss occurs. And many times it's compound. I got this little thing in my notes, and I don't even know if I want to say it, but what the heck, I'm out here. Just to give you an illustration of loss. Uh, as, as, as you all are aware, my marriage ended in 2019 and as you can imagine that was a huge loss for both of us for me and for her but what compounds the pain is that being in a position that I am as a pastor it also resulted in me losing members so without the opportunity to even grieve the greatest loss in my life more loss is compounded 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 and one of the most unhealthy things I did was to just push through. Instead of allowing myself time to grieve it all. Because what you do is you carry it forward with you. And it begins to affect your effectiveness with those who remain. There is a sense of loss when it's broken. Even in your cases where you might have had a situation where you've had a toxic relationship that you knew needed to end. Just the fact that there was knowledge of its toxicity does not mean that there was not an attachment. Even though you knew this is not healthy for me, this is not good for me, severing that still resulted in a loss. And if you found yourself in one of those situations, the people around you were quick to tell you, don't even cry over that. Forget about that. One good for you. Move on. And you may have tried. But the reality of it is, is that that loss was demanding some attention. That heaviness was demanding some attention. So you might have smiled through it. You might have went on, met somebody else, whatever, but you still kept dragging the residue of that unresolved grief. We see it played out in the Bible. We see the situation with David when, when, when King Saul turned on David and David had to run for his life. And, and then Saul and Jonathan got killed later in a battle. 
And we can understand clearly why David would mourn the death of Jonathan because Jonathan became his best friend. David said, the love Jonathan had for me was greater than the love of a woman. That was his due. That was his friend. But why, could, why was David mourning the death of Saul and Saul was trying to kill him? What you got to understand is that at some point there was a relationship. And even when Saul turned, David was still honoring the relationship. David was still determined not to touch God's anointed. David was determined to honor the relationship and then death severed it. And you find the future king grieving. And like I said, this is when people normally show up and sometimes meaning well, telling you, come on, you got to move on, got to pick yourself up. But the reality of it is, is that in order for me to handle this loss and handle this loss properly, I got to let myself grieve. Listen, the amount of the intensity of the loss that you feel is tied to the replaceability of whatever you lost. In other words, how easy it is for you to replace the thing you lost determines how deeply you grieve. People are irreplaceable. Whether you lose them through death, ending of marriages, ending of relationships, friendships. You might get another spouse. You might get another friend. But the reality of it is, it will never be that person. And so the level of grief, grief is intense. And not just just people. What about the loss of your health? The loss of your church family, the loss of, of, of your dream because circumstances now prove where you can't make this thing happen like you dreamed it would happen. It's irreplaceable. And so the grief is heavier. The loss feels heavier. So the requirement for grieving is greater. Man, I hope y'all are just let me talk to you today. I promise you we'll be more passionate the next time. But I got to carefully lay this foundation because I need you to understand what you're up against, what I'm up against. I need you to realize this. Hear me when I say this. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. Loss is not the enemy. Ignoring it is. See, when you ignore it, it doesn't go away. It just buries itself deeper. And then you end up having this compounding effect. What I mean is this, is that loss that goes unresolved becomes loss that stacks on top. And so what happens is, here you are in 2021, and you have a what technically, if it stood by off by itself, you have something that's fairly small that you're losing. But because you haven't resolved all the other losses, it's no longer small. It's on top of this already growing mound of unresolved things. And you will overreact. Some of you are hypersensitive to things. Not because that moment deserved that reaction, but it's because all the past reactions are building on top of each other. Have you ever been on the receiving end of somebody's uh, outburst and you're trying to figure out, I know what I did didn't deserve that because we don't resolve. It's so easy for us to run into 2021 with all our plans and visions and all the stuff that we said we're going to do. And we're going to get those things done. But this is the unfinished business that we have to handle. Here is something that you won't like to hear, but it's not going to stop it from being true. Loss is oftentimes the necessary ingredient for growth. Loss is the necessary Ingredient. It's the great ingredient you've been missing that has kept you from growing. Remember the Bible says that 
that if the, if the seed doesn't fall to the ground, the kernel of the seed doesn't fall to the ground uh, and, and die, the seed abides alone. In other words, there's a picture of this. The seed can never become what it's supposed to until a part of it dies. The kernel is the hard outer shell of the seed until that outer shell releases the seed that's inside the shell. The seed can never become what it was destined to become. And so oftentimes, loss is the thing that jettisons you forward into the place that you're, that you're supposed to be in. This is what Solomon was trying to teach you and I in Ecclesiastes 7 and 3. When he wrote those words, sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, by the sadness that's on your face, the heart is made better. Sorrow, that's grief. Grief. Grief that comes from a loss. Why is that necessary? Oftentimes, listen to me, it takes a loss for you to grow in the area of appreciation. Most of the times, because of our immaturity, because we didn't receive the right information that allowed us to grow up, we handle things or we devalue things that should be incredibly valuable to us. And there's an old saying that has proven to be true. Whatever you don't appreciate, you lose. And the term appreciation means increase it in value. When we don't take care of who we have, what we have, opportunities that we have, sorrow comes in to check you and teach you oftentimes a tough lesson. And through that loss, that's when you finally appreciate it. Am I making sense? And he says that right there, that, that, that thing that happens in your life, that loss that happens in your life, that begins to teach you how to appreciate things, it is better than laughter. See, the thing about laughter is this is that laughter is really just tied to the moment. There was something that just happened right there that did something to you to make you joyful, make you, make you feel good. It's, it's, it's a momentary thing, and it fades away. But the power behind sorrow is that sorrow makes you ask questions. And here's what you've got to understand. Until you start asking questions, you will not grow. It requires, growth requires questions. That's why when your babies are coming along, they, for some reason, somehow, some way, they learn the word why. Why, why, why. And they'll keep asking why until it does what? Make sense to them. And then somewhere along the way, we receive this lie that does not line up with Scripture whatsoever, that we cannot ask questions of God. And see, when you are being a good father to your child, you don't avoid your child's questions. They might get on your nerves, but you realize I need to help this baby out because this baby's trying to grow, trying to learn. And if I don't feed them the proper information, I'm afraid somebody will feed them the false information. So I prefer for them to come ask me because I'm their daddy. I'm their mother. Don't nobody love them like I do. So I'm, I'm bound to give them the right information. And scripture goes on to say that if you... If your earthly fathers, being as wicked as they are, know how to give you good things, how much more does the Father in heaven know how to give you? If you and I have this inclination to do right by the folks that, are respons that we're responsible for, our children, our friends, how much more do you think God desires to do right by you? And so he's a father waiting for you to ask him why. Why, God? What is this? Why did this happen? How should I respond to this? Sorrow makes you ask questions. Hmm. Sorrow makes you run to God. 
And scripture says, well, well, let me, I jumped over something. Let me give this to you. It, it said that sorrow is better than laughter. Let's, let's go back to better. And that word better, because I got to give you this. Be, better in this text literally, <laughs> literally means uh, uh, more beneficial. But watch this. It said favor. Question. What if we've overlooked the favor of God? Because it made us cry first before it taught us. Hmm. What if we stopped listening because we were hurting too bad? What if the pain was just an indication that a great lesson was coming behind it? And if we had followed the information of God, we would know that because in Isaiah, he says, I won't let any pain come upon you without making something new come from it. Imagine if we had operated in that information as opposed to the information that we do traffic in that says that if it's hurt, if it hurts, you need to avoid it. If it hurts, you need to run from it. If you hurt, you need to shut down and you don't need to hear anything after that. What if we would have found the information of God and been the thinkers we've been designed to be and thought on these things that if this thing is hurting me and if it feels like such a great loss, then there is a promise from the word of God, the truth of God that says, I'm going to make this sacrifice make sense to you because what I'm going to give you on the backside of this won't compare to what you've gone through. Y'all know the Bible says that it says this present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed after this. What if we had received that information so that we could understand and manage the loss a little bit better? That does not mean I don't grieve because God wants me to grieve, but he also promised me something. He said he's going to give me a garment of praise in exchange for my heaviness, which means that he's not, he's not telling me not to be heavy. He just said, listen, when you come Come through all of that. I'm going to give you a reason to tell me thank you. I'm going to give you a reason to shout hallelujah. I'm going to give you a reason for this thing to make sense. I'm going to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you think. But I need you to think like this. God says, let me make this thing make sense to you. He's looking for us to ask questions. That scripture ends by saying, because the sadness on your face, let me pause here. If there is sadness on your face, God is saying, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to let it be known, to let it be seen. Quit stuffing it down because you want to look strong to people. You want to impress people with how you're able to go through anything without shedding a tear. Trust me, that doesn't make you all that impressive. It makes you look a little dangerous, a little narcissistic, a little closed off. God is saying that sad look on your face is going to produce what? A better heart. That heart represents your soul. You're allowing yourself to grieve. You're allowing yourself to ask questions. You're allowing yourself to search out information because it, it improves your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion. My mind is where I ration. When I go, when I go through stuff, what I'm supposed to do is go search out information. Pain is supposed to make me want answers. And remember now I started this thing out by saying you and I become whatever information we receive because we're thinkers. And so when something breaks my heart, you ought to want to figure out it's okay. I'm listen, listen to me. It is okay for you to want to find out why. You should be searching for better information because you begin to realize whatever I've been operating in put me in this place. And the pain is telling me I don't want to come back to this place again. And so I ought to be seeking out God. And you know that's what we do. Let this thing hurt bad enough and you'll stop doing the stuff that you shouldn't be doing and you'll take yourself and you'll run right to the feet of God. And that's the beginning of making your heart right, your soul right, your mind, your will. Our will is my place of determination. 
if that thing hurts bad enough, you will make a decision. You will be determined within yourself. I am not going through this again. And if the loss is beyond your control, like the loss of a loved one, God controls all of that. But what ought to happen is this. You ought to begin to seek out information to be a thinker, a better thinker, when those situations come back around again. And so now I ought to be somewhere over in Thessalonians and, and hearing what God tells me to do. He says, listen. He said, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. But I need you to catch something, though. He did not say we do not grieve at all. He didn't say that. He said, we just don't grieve like the people who have no hope. What should I have hope in, God? Because listen, he said, I promise you, those who die in me shall be the first that I get up when I come back. And then you'll meet them all in the air. God begins to show us in his information that ought to have us thinkers in those, in those moments later on. When we lose somebody, we ought to be able to pull ourselves back up, not because we're suffocating our feelings, not because we're suppressing how we feel, but we have a greater understanding. We don't got, we've got an understanding about a thing. I realize I've lost this person, I lost that person, but I know that this person is saved. And so I know where they are. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's information from God. I know where they are. I have this cloud of witnesses watching over me. I know where they are. Just the knowledge of that ought to make me feel a little bit better. But also I need to understand this, is that death is inevitable. That's in the book. It is appointed to every man to die. So this ought to charge me to make sure that people that I say that I love know Jesus. It ought to make me want to reach out to folks. It ought to make you want to share these, 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 these sermons, make you want to call somebody and find out if they know God because the information says this, that we all have to die. But I want to make sure that our separation is not permanent because the good information, the information that makes sense to me, tells me that if I want to be with you beyond this world, we both have to say yes to Christ. And it does not mean hmm, that I won't cry at your funeral. But what I've experienced personally is that my tears are a little bit different when I know they're saved. I know I'm not saying goodbye. I know I'm only saying see you later. See you later. I know that I'm not saying goodbye. I know I'm saying you see me now. I'll see you later. You're watching from heaven now. And it changes my grief. I still grieve your absence, but I'm able to recover sooner. Sorrow, grief, loss was given to me to learn. One of the shortest verses in the Bible it's found over in John 11 and 35, and it simply says, Jesus wept. Jesus began to publicly cry at the graveside of his friend Lazarus. The sisters ran to him, and they were grieving the loss of their brother. And they said some things to him, and they said, listen, he would have been all right if you had got here in time. And there we see the Savior, the maker of all things, crying at a grave. Why would Jesus cry when he knew he was going to resurrect him anyway? Here's what I believe is that Jesus was the consummate teacher. He was always teaching. And although he knew the outcome, he was showing them that it's okay. Not only is it okay, it's necessary for you to be able to process the loss, process it, run it through you, let it take its course, process the loss. It's necessary. You see, now I'll go a little further. The women were already crying. Maybe. Maybe he did it for the men. 
Because standing there is the most powerful man they'd ever seen. Grieving. And still stepping forth to exercise his power. He still, with tears streaming down his face, said, Lazarus, come forth. He was still as powerful as he was before he shed a tear. Maybe he was sending us a message that has traveled throughout generations to get to us today, brothers. That it's okay to express the emotions of a moment. It's okay to express the feelings of betrayal before they become rage. It's okay to express the feelings of heartbrokenness before it becomes bitterness. Unexpressed emotions don't stay where they where you found them. They become progressively worse. It's okay to say that it hurt. It's a loss. And whenever there's a separation of any kind, it's a loss. And grief stands there offering its services to you so that the healing can begin, so that you can move forward without the weightiness of it. Hmm. I think we'll stop there, team. We're just getting the folks ready for the common release. I hope I held your attention. I hope the tone and the pace didn't distract you. I just need you to get this. You've taken some losses, not just last year, throughout your life. That's been compounding and making it very difficult for you to become who you're supposed to become. Making it very difficult for me to become who I'm supposed to become. I get it. I get it. Perhaps this is the weight that scripture says we need to lay aside along with our sin, lay aside every sin and every weight that so easily besets us. This is a heaviness that you weren't supposed to still be carrying, but you are because you don't have the right information about it. You hadn't heard how God tells you to process it. And again, he did not say to not grieve. He did not say to not grieve. All right. Let me give you the takeaway. The takeaway says this. Denying that you've experienced loss this year and in the preceding years is a surefire way of ensuring that you will continue to suffer in those same losses going forward. You're going to drag them with you. God has given us understanding of this heaviness we've carried for so long so that we can lay this weight aside, embrace the life he died for us to have, and become a blessing to those who get to watch us live. Let's heal so we can live. Let's heal so we can live. Let's take care of this unfinished business before we get gung-ho about what we'll do this year in our efforts of restoration, uh, revival, recovery. Let's take care of this inner work so that we don't have to pretend that we're okay, that we can actually be okay and stop damaging one another with all of our broken pieces. Hmm. Young man, young lady, this all begins with you receiving Christ in your life and allowing him to shine a light on some things and make the word make sense to you, allowing him to facilitate some connections with people who can become your support as you do this heavy lifting of becoming a new creature. It starts with Jesus. And you have to admit that you need his help. That's all salvation is, is you saying, I need some help. 
If you're ready to admit that you need some help and you're ready to receive it from Christ, repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you so much for Jesus. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And because of my faith and because of my confession, the Bible tells me I'm saved, rescued. I'm now a child of God. Holy Spirit, come live inside of me. Let's change me and give God glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we go also, we want to give you a chance to sow into the ministry. As always, I thank you for your contributions. We try to tell you no contribution is too small. We're grateful for whatever you uh, send our way. We truly are. You can give through our website at cymm.org forward slash give. You can give through our cash app at dollar sign we are CYM. You can find us on the Givelify app. Just look us up on there and you'll see us, CYM, Changing Your Mind Ministries here in Greenville. Also right there on your screen through Facebook, there's a donate button if you'd like to use that for ease. They do send it to us. And so I want to tell you, thank you in advance for how you're supporting us that enable us to do these things for you and present in a manner that we do. It's a little weighty, wasn't it? So much so that I had to slow it down, but this is our reality. And I need you to hear me. I don't need you to be so emotional that you don't hear me. We've got to fix this, this time, this time. This isn't the first time that God has presented us with this opportunity. But this time, COVID, all these other things have taught us to do what? Appreciate. We're going to appreciate the fact that God has given us another shot to get this right. So if you don't mind, tell him thank you with me. Thank you, Lord. All right. Till next time. Much love.